knee deep in my failures. But now the waters of change wash over my head. I do this because I know who I am. I do this because I'm forgiven. I do this because he rose. I know no water can change me, but this water is a sign that change has occurred in my heart. My life will never be the same. So now I'm proclaiming it to the world. And just as Jesus was buried, I will be buried. Just as Jesus rose, I will rise. Faith, hope, love, none are greater than these. I have faith that Jesus is who he says he is. I have hope in his resurrection and his everlasting power. His endless love has forever changed my life. MC3 today. And let me just, I, you know, sometimes I, I'll say this. And so some of you guys go, Art, right, you always say this, but I really do mean this. It is a big deal to come to church. And so I thank you uh, for being here. And I thank you if you're excited about that. That's a really cool thing as well. Just to be able to get together is, uh, is, really, is really incredible. Uh, and so thank you for being here today. And if this is your first time for being here, we especially uh, want to uh, say thank you for being here. It's a big deal to come for the first time to a church, not knowing where things are at, who's here, and that sort of thing. And kind of like, you know, is it going to be uh, weird? Are they cultish? You know, what, what's, what's happening? You know, and there are some quirkiness uh, to us, I guess you might say. But nonetheless, glad you're here today. Um, if you are here for the first time, then afterwards, I encourage you to see either a G or Melissa. It's probably Melissa this, this week. Uh, and uh, she's got a free gift for you. Um, so Easter's coming up, and you notice the cards on uh, the chair. Um, and some of you guys go, okay, what's up with the cards? It's just really a reminder for us to invite others around us. We've been, we've kind of thrown out, thrown this challenge out to all of us to invite, uh, you know, hey, maybe at least three people every week, right? Uh, just to come. And I realize we are not in the age of paper, but this is a good reminder for us. You can take a pic of it. You can uh, text, you can email, whatever you want to do, uh, a friend or a family member or whoever, uh, and say, hey, man, I'd love for you to come uh, be a part of church on Sunday morning. And so as a staff, we got together and we kind of set some goals for us when it came to Easter. And one of those goals is, hey, we wanted to have an incredible fellowship. And I'm going to tell you something, that's what we do best, really. And so today, uh, if you were able to go into the cafe and you guys saw or smelled the breakfast that was there, man, that's, uh, that is that um, uh, is uh, the Christina and David and Michelle uh, all got together and uh, did that for us. Absolutely incredible. And so we want to be able to, absolutely, yeah, definitely. And, um, and they, I mean, that, that's, that's great stuff. So here's the thing, on Sunday morning Easter, um, I know we're going to start at 930, but since you guys are in the house, we'll give you inside information. 915, we're actually going to have breakfast. And so if you want to be a part of that, uh, there's a sign-up sheet, an uh, old school, go, kicking an old school sign-up sheet in the uh, cafe. Love for you to sign up and say, hey, I'll bring, you know, whatever. Uh, I, you know, I'll bring cereal if that's, if that's your jam, okay? Uh, and so, uh, but it's all right in there. So we wanted to have an incredible fellowship. Uh, we also um, wanted to um, kind of set, not that numbers mean a lot, set that goal for, uh, for on Sunday morning for 200. Last, last year, we hit 180. And so um, we've, we've grown since then. And so we feel like we can do 200. And so we'll have more chairs out. So it'll, be, it'll look a little bit different when you get in, the, in here on Easter Sunday, just so we can um, uh, give people opportunity uh, to have a place to sit. And so when you come in on Easter, uh, it'd be great just to kind of sit towards the middle, which will help us out a little bit uh, with people coming in. Because so, sometimes you come in and go, eh, I can't see, especially if we're all standing up. So uh, just, that's, a, that's a cool thing. And then, uh, and we can't control this at all. We can't control the other one either, but, um, we, but uh, we thought it'd be great to have a baptism uh, on that Sunday too. So what you have, your job in that is just to be praying, 
praying that that take place. And so uh, those are those are the really really cool things. So interestingly enough, today we're talking about Jesus's baptism. We've been talking about how do we know that Jesus really is the Messiah. We've talked about the Old Testament. We've talked about the prophets, but also too, there's something about Jesus's baptism. This kind of shouts that he's the Messiah. And I don't know about you, but have you ever been, think about this, have you ever been a part of someone's baptism before? You know, it's memorable when we have our own baptism, but when you're a part of someone else's baptism, that's an incredible experience. It's, you know, we talked about this last week that there are people in our spiritual lineage that have helped us get to where we are. Somehow we found out about Jesus, right? And when we baptize someone, we're a part of their spiritual lineage. We play that role, right? We get a chance to do that. And it's an incredible experience. I know for me, some of the most, uh, the, the top, I guess you might say, baptisms would be for my boys, Caleb and Landon. You know, those are, those are, those are uh, two that I want to make sure that I, um, oh, you, you found the pick. Oh my goodness. How, my goodness. Good job, Carrie. So she reached way back and pulled that out. So that, the, um, and, and yeah, there's a spot there too. I don't know what that's all about. So anyways. <laughs> But that keeps getting bigger, and so we need to pray about that, actually. So, um, but that's memorable. But I'm going to tell you something. The second most memorable baptism was for my grandmother. So years ago, Christy and I were serving over at Antioch Christian Church over in Canton, Georgia. And my mom and dad came into town. They brought my grandma, grandmother in, and um, they stu stuck around and hung out. I, I think, I don't remember, Caleb may have been uh, firstborn. I don't remember exactly when this was. I should know, but I don't remember the timing of it all. I just know they came into town, and they went to church with us on Sunday. So we had a baptism that Sunday, and typically you had this, like, gap where you got to, you know, kind of do a, make sure that you um, not necessarily entertain people, but we use that time to talk about baptism while the other guy is back there getting ready and the people that are ba getting baptized are getting ready. So I wasn't baptizing whoever was getting baptized. Ken was the minister at the time. And so I got down front and I opened up scripture and I always had something ready and prepared and I read it and, and I said something, I don't even know what I said. But uh, after service, you know, we went to lunch, and then the next day, I believe my grandmother and my mom and dad left out of t left for back home. Two weeks later, I get a call from my grandmother. Something that was said, something that was read, I don't know, something resonated within her. And she says, Art, uh, actually, actually, not what she said. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I am trusting you with this, right? I am trusting you with this. Um, and I do not go by this name, and, uh, and I'm, and, but she would call me Artie, right? Uh, and she said, Artie, I need to get baptized. And so I said, okay. And so we talked through it a little bit. And so we made the plan that the next time Christy and I were in Indy, which probably would have been Christmas time, that we were going to baptize her. And so I called my uh, home church, Win uh, Windfall Christian Church, and they set us up, and I was able to baptize my grandmother. That's an incredible thing. Uh, to think about, right? That that happened. And so it is an incredible experience when we have the opportunity to be a part of someone's baptism. But could you imagine, could you imagine what it was like to baptize Jesus? And you know, here's the thing too, think about this. We are all called to do this. This is our, this is our mission, right? Uh, Jesus, just before he ascended into heaven, uh, there with his followers, he said, he said this, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, based upon that authority that God the Father had given the Son, remember Jesus holds the keys to death in Hades, right? And so he says, all authority has been given to me. And he says, therefore, go and make disciples. To which the question you have is, well, how do you do that, right? How do you go and make disciples? Well, the great thing is, Jesus answers that in his next breath. He says this, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so while we might remember our own, it is something special to be a part of someone else's baptism, to be able to get in the water with them and see that all the way through. There is something special about that. And then I got to thinking, what was it like for John the Baptist to baptize Jesus? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Could you imagine what that was like, that you're going to baptize the Son of God, the spotless Lamb, the Messiah, 
you're actually going to baptize him? What was that like for, for John? You know, John was called John the Baptist, or if, you, if you've ever seen The Chosen, he, they call him John the Baptizer. It's also been called uh, in certain uh, uh, places in commentaries, John the Immerser. Uh, and so John was the cousin of Jesus. He knew Jesus. They hung out together just a little bit, I assume. Uh, and so uh, John was there just doing ministry. He was tasked by God to get things set up for Jesus, for the Messiah, to get everything ready to kind of pump up the crowd. He was kind of the, uh, the opening band, if you will, you know, before the main event happens. And so he was getting everybody ready and pointing towards a time when Jesus would arrive. In fact, his sermons were basically this. His message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so a large number of people started showing up, going, leaving the cities or leaving their little villages, going out to where John was, out by the Jordan River, to hear him preach. We assume they went to hear him preach. Could be the fact that they went to go, I heard that he's got this incredible palate of eating locusts and wild honey. Let's go see this guy. Or it could have been his incredible attire uh, as he was wearing camel's hair and a leather belt, kind of like Elijah in the Old Testament. Or maybe they, they appreciated his fiery approach to preaching. Uh, and then others may have shown up to find out, is John the Messiah? Is he the one we've been looking for? Is he the one that, that the prophets have talked about? And so people showed up to listen to John. And, and listen, his message was very, very clear that he was not the Messiah. In fact, uh, in Matthew, it records that uh, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. You see, John's baptism was different. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But he says, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I'm not worthy to even carry around. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So there's that fiery preaching, right, that he's got. And so what he's saying is, listen, this guy who's coming, right? He didn't say his name, but his name is Jesus, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, nobody, except through him, except through the Messiah, except through Jesus. And so John's baptism was not necessarily, it wasn't a baptism of salvation. It was not the same as a Christian baptism uh, because Jesus hadn't yet went to the cross and died for our sins. Jesus had not yet raised from the dead. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance of sin, a confession of sin, a commitment to strive and live a holy life, but still it wasn't the same. But he came to kind of prime the pump for Jesus that would come. In fact, the Pharisees showed up kind of asking him, so like, are you the Messiah? Uh, and it say, he goes on to say this. He says, they asked him, he says, well, then why do you baptize if you're not the Messiah? nor Elijah, nor the prophet. And so John just said this. He says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one who you do not know. So Jesus was in the crowd. He's the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. Now, you think about what John says about Jesus, that he's not even worthy to carry his sandals. He's not worthy to untie those sandals. He's not worthy to be that servant that's at the lowest level to do that sort of thing. And yet... John knew Jesus. Again, we, John was Jesus's cousin. Jesus's mom, when she was found to be pregnant, went to stay with John the Baptist's mom. And if you know the story from Christmas, John the Baptist is, is a baby inside of Elizabeth, and he jumps for joy uh, when Mary walks in pregnant with Jesus. Their families probably got together at the holidays. Mary probably bought mashed potatoes and apple pie, uh, and Elizabeth probably brought, brought locusts and other bugs and honey from the honeycomb, right? Uh, and they knew one another. They knew one another. John was in some ways the last Old Testament prophet, right? Kind of the last of the Old Testament prophets. But there's this kind of this handing off of the Old Testament to the New Testament as Jesus steps up, right? And so John says, listen, I'm a, I mean, this is, I mean, here's the thing. He knows Jesus, been around him in the family. And he still, he says, I'm unworthy. I'm a nobody. 
I'm unqualified to carry around his shoes. That's who he says he is because Jesus really is the Messiah. He's the son of God. He is God and man. And John says, just wait, just wait until he comes. You know, sometimes I think as Christians, we get a little too cavalier with Jesus. We get a little too cozy with who he is. Have you ever seen the t-shirt that says, Jesus is my homeboy? Uh, or the other t-shirt that says, Jesus is coming, look busy, right? And so you see these t-shirts, but do we realize, do we recognize that Jesus is literally the son of God? He actually sits at the right hand of God Almighty. And John describes, describes him this way, that his eyes are like blazing fire, that his voice is so loud, it's like, it's like the sound of many rushing waters. That's who Jesus is. That, and, and here's the thing, Scripture says that at just one glance, that every knee will bow. Not some, not half, not more than half, not 60 or 75 percent, but every knee will bow. It goes on to say that every, not some, but every tongue will confess one day that Jesus is Lord. That includes atheists, agnostics, devil worshipers, and everybody in between. Everybody will, will exclaim that Jesus really is the Son of God. And at the mere mention of his name, Demons run in terror. They run in flee, which is why they don't want you praying. They would rather have you being busy doing other things than praying in Jesus' name, because they don't want that name. It's why the world hates the name of Jesus. That's, you can, you can, you can um, disparage every other religious leader, and people will throw rocks at you. You disparage Jesus, and people cheer. How is that? It's because it's because the demons don't want to hear Jesus' name. They're, ter they're terrified at it. And so this is the Jesus that we worship. See, Jesus isn't my homeboy. He's my Lord, and he's my Savior. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the Messiah that we worship. He's the Messiah that we pray to. And as we see in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, he is the Messiah that steps in front of John and says, basically, I need to be baptized by you. So scripture says that Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Now, why would Jesus do this? Think about this for a second. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance, right? So you have to have sins in order to repent of those sins. Why does Jesus come? Why does he have to go there in the first place? Jesus has no sins. What's he going to confess to? You know, John, I need to confess that. Well, actually, I have no confession, right? I did, I've not done anything wrong. That's, that's Jesus. He didn't do anything wrong. There's no reason why he needed to be baptized. He didn't commit what, not even one sin, no, not, a, not even a, a small little, little, he didn't even tell a little white lie. He had no sins. Verse 14 says that John recognized this, tried to deter, deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? That's a great question. What, why, are, why are you here? Out of all the people in the world, you do not belong here. In some ways, right? In some ways, that would be the thought. Here's Jesus coming to be baptized. And like, why are you doing here? You need to be, we need to switch roles. You need to be the one baptizing me. But I want you to hear Jesus' reply because his, re his reply is extremely important for you and for me. He says this, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. Think about that statement. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Now, that word fulfill, that's one to circle, underline in your Bible if you do that kind of thing. We talked about this word two weeks ago when we talked about the Old Testament law. That word is the Greek word that just simply means to complete or to finish, right? To complete or to finish. And so Jesus' baptism is important so that it might complete all righteousness. Not some, not part, but all righteousness. Which is interesting because the Old Testament does not require, the Old Testament never required us to be baptized. So why would Jesus say it is 
proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness? Well, it's because baptism was the obedient thing to do. You see, Jesus is the Messiah because Jesus was fully obedient to the Father, fully obedient to the Father. Let me, let me kind, of, um, kind of verbal process with you just a little bit, if I can, if you kind of give me just kind of a moment to kind of think this out a little bit. Have you ever, you ever done something, um, even, um, even though it wasn't necessarily required, that you just kind of did it anyways? Maybe um, as a kid, uh, you decided, I'm going to clean my room. Parents didn't ask you to do that. You just said, I'm going to clean my room. And so you just went around and you didn't, and you didn't throw everything in the closet, right? Or under the bed. You actually cleaned. Anybody ever do that actually? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't. So yeah. So see good, some good folks. All right. Uh, or maybe, maybe, maybe you just, you, you look, you walked by in the kitchen, saw the pile of dishes and you went, you know what? I, I need to wash those. And you just started washing dishes, right? Putting them in the dishwasher and all of that. Didn't, didn't need to be told. You just did it because that was what needed to be. That was the obedient thing to do. Or maybe, maybe you walked out and you're like, okay, the lawn needs to be mowed. And I don't know if dad's going to do it. So I'm going to, I'll just go out there and I'll make it, I'll make it happen. And so you went out and you, you just did it, right? Or maybe, maybe this, maybe, Maybe one day you were in Kroger or wherever, right, with Brian. You just you talked to Brian and said, hey, Brian, because Brian always says hi to everybody. And then you walked in and you went, you know what? I'm going to get my wife flowers. You know, it's, I know it's not, it's not Valentine's Day. It's not her birthday. It's not Christmas. It's nothing. Just a regular random day. It's going to go buy her flowers. And you decided to buy her flowers. Maybe you decided to write her a note, right? Uh, just, just because. You didn't have to do that, but you wanted to do that. That was something that you wanted to do. Sometimes it seems that we tend to do and tend to lean towards doing the minimum requirements. It happens at work all the time, right? I'll do the, I'll do the basic, right? Uh, but I'm not going to give extra because I don't see anybody else giving extra, so I'm not going to give any extra. Or, uh, or you, know, uh, I, you know, at home, I'll, I'll, I'll cut the grass, but I'm not going to, you know, nobody gives a rip, so I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it, right? I'm not going to get everything totally right. And so sometimes we find ourselves doing the minimum requirements, right? Not just, not, you know, not, a, not everything over the top, but just enough. I want just enough to fulfill the hours that I've got to work. And I remember as a kid, I, I watched, we would go pick up my dad sometimes from the factory, from Chrysler, and I watched grown men run out of the factory to their car. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, they must have been like, you know, waiting for the whistle, you know, like on your mark, get set, go, and they were gone. Uh, I, I was like, I was looking at him going, we don't even do that at school. Why were they, you know, so that was kind of weird to see that. But you know, here's the thing, it's hard to do the obedient thing. It's easy to do the good thing, you know, kind of the, the minimal, but it's hard to do the obedient thing. You know, because all of us, whether we know it or not, whether we think about it or not, we are working for the king, right? The king of kings. We work for him. Do everything as if you're working for the Lord. It happens at church, right? Um, do I have to serve on a ministry team? Do I have to be kind to everybody around me? Uh, do, I, do I have uh, to, uh, to come to church every Sunday? No, you get to serve on a minister team. You get to be kind to the people around you, and you get to come to church every Sunday. You know, there are, there are folks, I, there are folks that, that are here today that it was a complete struggle physically to get here. It took everything they had to get here. They offered a sacrifice that cost them something. For me, I was able to get up, you know, kind of do whatever I wanted to do and get here, right? That sacrifice wasn't nearly as deep as others. And so we get to do those things. And so sometimes we get caught just doing the minimum requirements. If I could just kind of just uh, get by, I'll be okay. Sometimes we're willing to do the good thing, but we're not necessarily willing to do the obedient thing. Case in point, Years ago, we lost our senior minister, and, um, uh, and there were some, definitely not all, <laughs> definitely not all, uh, and I was one of those all, but there were some that asked, well, when is Art going to throw his hat into the ring? To which I would have replied, heck no, I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm just being completely honest with you, just going to be being completely honest with you. So we, they went through the process. Um, 
uh, and uh, you know, looking for someone, candidates came in, and one particular candidate came in, and he just kind of wanted to talk to me, you know, mano y mano, and so we slipped into one of the rooms, and he was just asking me questions, and I was, um, you know, telling him about the church and all of that, and then he asked me, well, why don't you want it? I said, well, you know, I gave him kind of a, you know, ah, that's just not for me, Lord's not, that's not something the Lord has for me, da 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 so he leaves out of there, and I think it was Jim Barber he talked to, and maybe I shared this with you before, and so as he's talking to Jim, he looked and he goes, so why didn't Art want to do this? He goes, I don't know, you know, da, da. and so he said, and then he said this, do you think Art's running from God's will? <laughs> and there was probably something to that, willing to do the good thing, but not the obedient thing. And so that's hard sometimes to do the obedient thing. Thing. It's easy to do the bare minimum and not necessarily do what God has called us to do. How obedient, let me ask you this question, how obedient are you willing to be for the Lord? How be obedient are you willing to be for the Lord? Listen, I know that in, you, in, in times past, it was important to be obedient to God and to do the obedient thing. And it's, not, it's, never, it's never been easy, right? when we start looking into what our future could be as a, a nation and as a world, it's going to be tougher. And this world is going to need some heroes that will actually stand up and not just do the good thing, but will do the obedient thing, to do the obedient thing. You know, I think about um, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, if you remember that story in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 3, they were just asked, listen, here's this statue, when the music sounds, I just need you guys, everybody just get down and, and bend your knee uh, to this thing. And they wouldn't do it. And they were told, you know, they, they, people said, hey, these, guys, these three guys, they won't do it. Now, these, these three guys were high up leaders. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. The king went to them and said, okay, guys, I don't know what the big deal is. What's the problem? I, here's what I need you to do. I just need you to bend your knee. Just one knee. Just bend down and be like everybody else and just bend your knee and bow down to this thing. When the music starts, that's all you got to do. Just be like everybody else. How easy would that have been? And on some level, doing the good thing because you're giving that example to the people around you, although it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing. But still, sometimes we think of it like, well, you know, we kind of rationalize. Oh, I guess it can be a good thing, right? And so just, just go along with everybody else. But they wouldn't do it. In fact, they told the king, this is their response, in fact, they were, they were told, if you don't do this, we're throwing you into a furnace. I mean, a literal furnace, a literal furnace. And so they said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, ah, you got that's one to circle and underline, even if he does not. We want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Why wouldn't they do that? Because that's not the obedient thing to do. That's not the obedient thing to do. You see, we can choose to do the good thing and do the bare minimum. But what we're called to do is to do the obedient thing that God has called us to, not the good thing, no matter what. This is exactly what Jesus was doing when he was baptized. He was doing the obedient thing. Jesus, John says, I need to be baptized by you. What are you here for? Jesus didn't set out to do the good thing. He set out to do the obedient, th obedient thing. And his baptism is an example for you and for me. Baptism is about following in Christ's footsteps, being obedient to the will of God. Jesus is only one, the only one in all of history that fully was fully obedient to God, fully obeyed God. See, this is how we know that Jesus really is the Messiah because he was fully obedient to the Father. You see, that's impossible for you and for me. I don't know about you, but I messed that up a long time ago. I messed it up a long time ago. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was obedient. He was obedient in the big things and in the little minute details, every little part he was obedient in. And here's how God in heaven responds to Jesus's obedience as he's being baptized by John the Baptist. It says in verse 16 in Matthew 3, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. 
And at that moment, heaven was opened, ripped open. And he saw, and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased, well pleased. This is one of the few times that we see in scripture, the Trinity clearly witnessed all in one place right here was at Jesus's baptism. God, the father, he's applauding. God, the spirit is descending on Jesus and God, the son is obediently following his father's will. Oh, my friends, this is the beauty of baptism. This is, this is the beauty of baptism, and we don't see this a lot. We see the baptism, but we, this is the part that we don't see with our waking eyes, so to speak. When someone is baptized, God the Father is applauding, and not just him, but all the angels in heaven, Scripture says. All the angels in heaven are having a party because of that. The Spirit is descending on us and dwelling within us, and Jesus is glorified when we're baptized. That's what happens when we're baptized in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see, listen, baptism is the starting point. It's the beginning of our, of our new lives with Christ, with him. In fact, in Romans chapter 6, we see this, that our baptism is a reenactment of what Jesus did with his death, burial, and his resurrection. And so when you're baptized, you set out to be, you probably said, this is what I did when I was baptized, I set out to be fully obedient to Jesus. All right, God, let's go, let's do it, right? You know, and I'm, pro I'm probably sure that's that same day I did something stupid, right? Like, well, I didn't take, what in the world is that all about, right? And I just, I just was baptized and, you know, and, uh, you know, to, into, 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 into uh, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Now I messed it up. I don't know, I don't know if I stubbed my toe. I, who knows what I did, but I'm sure I messed it up that same day. I set out to be fully obedient. That didn't happen. And so sometimes we go, well, what, what happened there, right? Well, listen, no plan withstands contact from the enemy, right? No plan withstands contact from the enemy. Do you still sin after you believe in Jesus? Do you still sin after you repent of your sins? Do you still sin after you confess that Jesus is Lord? Do you submit or do you uh, sin after you submit to him in baptism? Sadly, the answer is yes. Yes. So what changed? <laughs> That's the best part. See, now we have the Holy Spirit within us helping us to push back the darkness, helping us to live this life in a way that would be Christ-like. Once I had no chance, once I was dead in the water without Christ, now I've got a chance. Now I've got God living in us, right? Now we got God teaching us as we open up his word and the Holy Spirit's pointing things out like, no, 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 don't do that, right? Stop being, stop being stupid, you know? Uh, don't do that. Do this right here, right? Do this right here. We have, the, we have the Holy Spirit helping us along the way, showing us how to live. And while we can't be sinless, we can each day sin less and less and less and less and less. You see, we strive to be fully obedient to Jesus, knowing that we aren't there. See, that's the whole reason why we needed a Savior. That's why we needed Jesus, why Jesus had to go to the cross, because you and I can't do it for ourselves. We need Jesus to step in and help us out. We need him. It's absolutely incredible to think about this. Part of me sometimes wonders, God, why do you even, you can think about, why, did, why do you even love me? Why do you care? Why would you, why would you do that? Why would you go to the cross for me? It's because he loves us. He cares for us. And he knew that if he didn't do it, nobody else would or could. He was the only one. And so we strive to sin less and less and less. Just we strive to be sinless. Uh, and he helps us with that, knowing that we're going to mess up here and there. And so if you're one of those that in a couple of weeks will be baptized, just know that's what, that's what happens. That's what happens. As we get ready to head into communion, that reminds us of all that Jesus has done for us. I'm reminded that one day John the Baptist, he looks out and he sees Jesus coming toward him. And John blurts out with everybody else around. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
the Lamb of God. Why would he say that? Why would he say those words, the Lamb of God? Well, John was referring to Jesus as the perfect and ultimate sacrifice for our sins. The Apostle Peter picks up on this in his letter. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the Apostle Peter writes this, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Not the old sacrifices wouldn't work. You couldn't bring a lamb or sheep or goat that would work. You couldn't pay your way or buy your way into heaven. You're not going to be able to slip a 20 into the hand of the Apostle Peter uh, up in heaven, right, uh, at, the, at the pearly gates. It's not going to happen. You can't, you can't just waltz in like that. But then he says this in verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, with the precious blood of the Messiah, that's what the Christ means, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Our faith, our hope, our salvation is in God through Jesus, the Messiah. And so when we come here in just a second to receive these emblems, it reminds us of his perfect sacrifice that he gave for us at the cross, for my sin, all of my sin, and for all of your sin. And so today, as we take the opportunity to partake of these emblems, we're going to partake in joy. There should always be a smile on your face in communion. Yeah, we want to be reverent, but you can be reverent and still smile, right? You can still do that. As we partake, we also partake in hope being hopeful of what God has for us, how he has, uh, he has done all of that so that we could be with him one day. That's hope, right? That's hope. Knowing that Jesus really is. I mean, he really is our Messiah. He really is. And so today we're going to take the opportunity as you take the bread to remember what Jesus has done. He is the Lamb of God and he did take away the sins of the world. And as you take up the cup, Remember his blood that was poured out for you and for me. We're going to have uh, people here in just a little bit down front, um, myself and Gerardo. Uh, if you need prayer today, this would be a good time to come when everybody gets up and if there's motion in the room because we're going to get you. By the way, if you're new with us, uh, we invite you to just get up and come down. You can take communion here. There's a couple tables in the back as well, and that's on purpose. Uh, just pull the curtain back so that there's motion in the room. Uh, somebody said something the other day. They said, you know, we've not ever taken it back to the tables, but now I can't not go back to the tables and bend my knees and just pray. There's some tables, back, prayer tables back here. We encourage you to take the time just to pray to the Lord. Thank him for what he's done. Thank him for his sacrifice. Thank him for the example he set before us. Thank, you, thank him for his obedience, full obedience. But without that full obedience, you and I are dead in the water. Dead in the water. There is no life after death for us if that happens. Uh, and yet he fully obeyed for us. Uh, and so um, if you want to thank him for that, table's running back. If you need prayer uh, and you, there's some nails in the back, you may look over here to the cross and go, what the, what's the deal with all that? Those are prayers in that cross. Uh, and if you've got, in fact, I just noticed today, I need to drill more holes. Oh, me of little faith. There are a lot of prayers in there. Uh, and so we got some heavy praying to do, guys, uh, so we can clear some of this space. Uh, and which brings us to the jar. The jar here has got nails in it. So if there is an answer to prayer, assuming you can find it, drop it in the jar. There's no better sound than the clink in the jar, knowing that God still answers prayer. But if you also need to know how, what those first steps are in the baptism, then come see Gerardo and I. We're right down here. And even afterward, even afterward, if you're a little bit worried or embarrassed or you're like, I don't know, I feel funny. Come see us. Come see us. Don't let this time pass you by. Don't let Satan snatch from you the opportunity to make that happen, to join Jesus, I guess you might say, in that baptism, to follow in his footsteps and to make him Lord and Savior. And so come and speak to us today. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your example. Thank you, Father God, for your, um,
love for the Father, such incredible love that you would be fully obedient to him in every detail. Father, I pray for that kind of love that I might be able to do that, the same thing in the small little details and into big things too. But Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord God, to be like you. And we thank you, Father, uh, that uh, from the very beginning of the world, you had already planned to come in and save us in such a way that Jesus would be the Lamb of God that would remove our sins. And so, Father, I thank you for going to the cross. I thank you for raising again three days later. And I thank you, Father, that we have joy and we have hope and we have salvation in you. Bless us as we partake. May we ever be reminded, Lord God, of your sacrifice for us and how we in turn should sacrifice for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.